About a week ago, I did a video on buying an HP Pavilion desktop with AMD's most powerful APU in the Ryzen 7 5700G in it, and I had a couple issues with it. First off, I had an issue with the RAM only being single channel and not allowing me to go past 2133 megahertz. And I had an issue with the BIOS basically not allowing any overclocking whatsoever. Long story short is that it was a decent PC, but it wasn't fully utilizing what the Ryzen 7 5700G can offer. So what did I do? I took the processor out of that HP machine and put it into my own custom ITX build. And let's just say it is way, way better. Let's check it out. Okay, so this is it, and you'll notice it is fairly small, and that is because I wanted to do a mini ITX build, and that is because there wasn't gonna be a graphics card, so why not go for it? So the case is an in-win chopping, chopping, choping, with a integrated 150 watt power supply, which is plenty enough if you're just powering a processor. For the motherboard, we went with a Gigabyte B550i. And this is a pretty solid motherboard. Uh, it comes with the basic features of a B55 chipset uh, and also with Wi-Fi 6 and two M.2 slots. So more than enough for what we're doing here. For RAM, we went with 32 gigabytes, so two 16 gigabyte sticks of Crucial Ballistics 3600 megahertz RAM that we are overclocking to 4000 megahertz later. And to cool it, we went with the Noctua NH L9A, which is Noctua's low profile CPU cooler, which is pretty much the only thing that would fit in here and give optimal performance. So I was like building in this thing. It was actually pretty easy considering that all you have to really do is fit a motherboard and heat sink in there. So I've done ITX builds before, but none of them sans GPU. So this was new. So that factor coupled with the fact that we're only using a single NVMe SSD in this build makes for pretty clean cable management considering all you have are two power cables. As you can see, it's relatively small. Uh, it fits pretty much on any desk you have unless you're an ant. The side panel is completely mesh. Now I know they have another version with tempered glass, but I'm more of a fan of performance and airflow rather than aesthetics. Uh, you also get mesh at the top, so allowing for a bit more airflow. Pretty solid case. I like it for what it is. It's small, it looks good, and it was easy to build in. So with that out of the way, let's plug it in and I'm actually gonna go over what I did in the BIOS to make this thing perform the way it does. Alrighty, let's plug you in. Okay, we're in the BIOS and the first thing you're gonna wanna do is go to the advanced screen. That'll give you kind of all the options you need for overclocking. Now one note is that I actually did have to upgrade the BIOS because with the BIOS that they shipped, I wasn't able to overclock the RAM at all. It just wouldn't allow me to change it. So we actually don't have to do much overclocking here to get peak performance out of this processor. This CPU is already way overkill for the graphics that it's driving. So the only thing we're gonna do for the CPU is enable Precision Boost Overdrive or PBO. So the way you do that is you go into, so go to settings, AMD overclocking, and you'll see something down here for precision boost overdrive. So click that and enable it. And that's all we're doing for the CPU. For GPU, it's a little different. We're gonna do some manual overclocking of the integrated graphics. So in that same menu, you'll see manual iGPU overclocking. When we go to that, it's gonna ask for a frequency and a voltage. Now, the base clock on the GPU is 2000 megahertz, and we're gonna bump it up to 2200. And I found that we have been pretty stable at 1.154 volts, or 1154 millivolts. And that's all we're doing for the GPU. And last but not least, RAM. So like I mentioned before, we have 32 gigabytes of 3600, and if you look in here, you'll see that the XMP profile shows that. 3600 
at cast latency 16. But we want to push it further. So you can see right underneath, we can actually set our own multiplier and we've set it to 40, giving us 4,000 megahertz. So you can just set this and hope it works, but if you're going above and beyond, you're probably gonna have to adjust the voltage. So it's pretty common at 4,000 megahertz RAM, you're gonna wanna supply 1.4 volts. So that's what we did down here. We set our DRAM voltage to 1.4, and that's it. Save your changes and load into Windows and you should be good. Now each chip is differently, every RAM is different, so these might not be exactly what you're gonna have to do. You might have to tweak it a little bit, but you know, just play around with it. And if you find that you're not able to get back into Windows or the BIOS, just clear your CMOS and it should revert back to normal. So if you load up CPU-Z, you'll see here that we are running the Ryzen 7 5700G. The memory, it always shows half the frequency because that's how uh, CPU-Z works. So you'll see that it's running at 2000 megahertz, which is actually 4000. And for graphics, you'll see that the core is running at 2200 megahertz, which means that our overclock has been applied and that our memory is also running at 2000 megahertz because integrated graphics uses your system memory as its video RAM, which is why RAM is so important to these Ryzen integrated graphics chips. Okay, let's talk benchmarks. First, I ran Cinebench R20, and in single core performance, we saw a score of 580, and in multi-core, we saw a score of 5481. Now, these are amazing scores for any CPU, much less an APU with integrated graphics. So this thing will handle anything you throw at it in terms of CPU intensive workloads. And that trend continues with Geekbench, where we saw a single core score of 1597 and a multi-core score of 9645. Again, amazing performing CPU. So when we ran the OpenCL test in Geekbench, which is a test of how the graphics are working, we got a score of 20,802 which compared to when I ran it on the HP is so much better and way more in line with what we expected out of this chip. Continuing on a time spy, another GPU intensive test, we got 1885 overall. Again, much more in line than what we saw from the HP desktop. Another benchmark I wanna go over is user benchmark. Now, it doesn't really give you an actual score per se, but it does tell you a lot about your system as a whole compared to other similar systems. So if we look at our results, overall you'll see, yes, it's awesome as a desktop because of its powerful CPU. But you can see it gave it a low score for gaming and workstation, and that's pretty obvious because this is comparing the overall scores against all systems, especially ones with integrated graphics. So that's expected. And I see right here at the top under PC status, this PC is likely operated by a technical master. Oh, user benchmark. Scrolling down, you'll see our Ryzen 5700G. And yes, the bench was a 100%, which is outstanding for a CPU. But I wanna note here that we scored in the 94th percentile of all other systems with this same CPU. And that was only by enabling Precision Boost Overdrive. Remember, we didn't really do much overclocking to the CPU itself. Now let's go down to the integrated graphics and 100th percentile, meaning that we are at the very top of systems utilizing this integrated graphics. So 94th percentile and 100th percentile on the CPU and GPU, I can't complain with that. We obviously got the most out of this chip and that's all I could ask for. That was my main goal overall with this build. It also shows uh, how your drives fared as well as RAM and RAM, you can see we scored 102%, which is outstanding for RAM. But since it didn't recognize what type of RAM exactly, it the scores are all over the place. All right, with all of that said, now, how do we perform in games? So I wanted to run similar games to what I did with the HP, just to give it a kind of good comparison. So let's start with your esports titles. League of Legends, 1080p high, and we were getting over 200 FPS. So you could definitely pair this with a high refresh rate monitor and play League of Legends with a high refresh rate, no problem. Moving on to CSGO, 
another eSport title, which isn't too difficult to run. And at 1080p medium settings, we were getting over 130 FPS. So again, very similar to League of Legends, you can use a high refresh rate monitor with this integrated graphics on eSports titles, no problem. Okay, let's move on to something a little more graphically intensive with Fortnite. Now, Fortnite didn't perform too great on the HP. It was playable, but barely. Now, running at 1080p, medium settings. Now, note with Fortnite, when you set it to medium, it also decreases the render resolution. So full medium quality at 1080p is probably rendering at like 720p. But with that, we were getting an average of 111 FPS, and sometimes just walking around with nothing going on, we were pinned at 120, which was my frame cap. So, so much more playable. And even in medium settings with a full render resolution of 1080p, we were getting over 60 FPS. And with an average FPS of 64, sometimes going as high as in the low 70s. So if you wanna sacrifice FPS for more resolution, you definitely have that option. Moving on to Call of Duty Warzone, similar to Fortnite with the HP, it was playable, but again, barely. At full 1080p resolution at 1080p rendered, on low settings, we were getting 43 FPS. Now, that's not the 60 you'd like to hit, but certainly much better than what we were seeing before and certainly playable. So kind of like with Fortnite, we decreased the render resolution to around 720p and we got a much more playable experience. We were getting over 60 FPS and barely saw it dip into the 50s, unless it was like heavy gunfight scenes. But I mean, over 60 FPS consistently on Call of Duty, pretty impressive. And the last game, The Witcher 3. This game, while it's old, it's still pretty graphically demanding. On the HP, we were running at 720p low and barely breaking 40. Now, we still stuck with 720p for this test, but we bumped up the quality to medium and we were averaging in the mid 50s. So again, playable. And if you want to turn it back down to low, you can probably get over 60 FPS. But I felt that 720p at medium looked a good bit better and I was willing to make that sacrifice in FPS because even mid 50s is perfectly fine. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty freaking awesome. The amount of performance gain we got utilizing our own hardware and not being limited by some proprietary stuff that HP had in place. But the last thing I wanna talk about is thermals and noise. Now, the noise coming from an ITX build, you're not gonna get a silent build, especially with a very powerful CPU like this. It's just not possible. I would equate it to something like a gaming laptop uh, it doesn't have a really high pitched whine like the small fans in those gaming laptops, but I mean, it does get a little bit loud. It sounds like a desk fan. So if you can put up with a desk fan, then you can put up with this. So for thermals, I ran Cinebench for a good while on loop and it did get up into the 80s and thermal throttled back down to about 3.8 gigahertz after about four or so minutes of 100% utilization, but I mean, that's to be expected for a CPU like this with a low profile cooler. Okay, overall thoughts. I am extremely happy with the performance we got out of the 5700G now that we had full access to its potential. Extremely minimal overclocking to the CPU, uh, 200 megahertz bump to the GPU, and overclocking the RAM to 4000 was all we did, and it's performing great. So would I recommend this? Mm, probably not. Yes, it is an awesome CPU, but the fact that you cannot buy this retail as of May of 2021 uh, makes it hard to recommend. You'd have to do what I did and buy an OEM build and pull it from that, and then you're just left with a PC with no processor in it. Now, if you were to do this, I would go with a bigger case. I know Cooler Master has a mini ITX case that's pretty awesome. It has enough space for a pretty decent cooling solution and even custom water cooling if you're into that. 
and it also has room for a GPU if you want to add it later. Uh, somebody on my previous video asked if they were to get this APU, would it be a good idea to buy it to play esports titles right now and then get a graphics card later? And yes, that is the ideal solution. That is what I would recommend. That's all I have today. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the 5700G in my Mini ITX build. If you have any experience with this processor or with Mini ITX builds in general, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear all about it. But if you like this video, be sure to drop a like. If you're interested in content like this, subscribe so you're notified the next time we post something awesome. See you on the next one.